Okay, so we'll, thanks everybody for joining. So just to let you know about the team members here first, myself, Martin Fordham, um, at the demonstration room at the city headquarters. Um, joining me are Aaron Solomons, Kerry Elgie, and Mike Penny. And they'll be helping answer questions at the end and passing those over to uh, the guys. Some of you may have attended the seminar we held earlier in the year on Free Actor. So if you're not totally familiar and didn't uh, join in on that, that's re available recording. So we can put a link uh, online later for you to uh, watch that at your leisure. Um, I have one of the, the modules of here set up. Okay. So. I'm going to uh, introduce briefly the guy that he leads. So we have Professor Nick Kapoor and Steve Marsden. Um, we will be talking about some of the chemistries that have been performed in the photo modules. And Nick's going to go into the more particular part of it. And then we're going to start off with Steve. Let's see the Nick introduce themselves in more detail. Um, so I'm going to next pass over to Steve Marsden and uh, we'll uh, see you later for the uh, questions at the end. Okay, thanks very much Martin. I'll just start sharing my screen. Right, well thanks very much for the, the chance to speak today. Um, so Nick and I are going to tell you a little bit about the uh, photochemical module uh, that we've added to the, the free actor platform. Um, so just a little bit by way of introduction. So uh, Nick uh, is a, a professor in mechanical engineering here at Leeds and uh, essentially an expert in uh, applied fluid mechanics. Uh, I'm an organic chemist uh, interested in developing new synthetic methods, particularly for the synthesis of biologically relevant molecules. Uh, that's still Nick and I, uh, so still a fluid a mechanics expert and a synthetic chemist. Um, and we've come together um, to work under the aegis of the uh, Institute of Process Research and Development at Leeds, which has been uh, established for about 13 years now. Uh, it's a cross-disciplinary platform where engineers, uh, chemists and other scientists come together to uh, try and solve problems uh, of relevance to um, process chemistry and scale up uh, towards manufacture. Um, so this is a kind of ongoing project within that, and Nick will tell you a little bit more about the history of the, the free actor. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction uh, to photochemistry itself and why there are issues with uh, scaling up photochemistry. I'm going to give that uh, some illustration by uh, talking about a couple of projects within our group where we have kind of hit the wall with some issues uh, of doing photochemistry, both in batch and in uh, tubular flow reactors. And that's going to sort of set the scene for why we felt there was a need for a new uh, type of photochemical reactor. Uh, Nick will take you through the background to the free actors and to the new photochemical module. Uh, and then we'll close with a couple of case studies where we've actually applied this, this new reactor um, and hopefully show you that we think there are, there are real benefits to this. Okay, so... Um, industrial photochemistry, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty underused technology. It's fairly niche. Um, you go all the way from very big scale applications, such as uh, free radical based tra uh, transformations initiated by light. So, for example, the, the Torre process to make caprolactam. Um, and these are uh, sort of you know, relatively cheap, well, very cheap uh, starting materials. Uh, the the Torre process, actually, the, uh, the economics of it are such that it's actually the, the price of the photo source that determines whether this is an economical process or not. Uh, so I think that gives you some kind of uh, feel as to the kind of value of the material that you're forming there. At the other end of the scale, um, we've got niche products. So, for example, vitamin D3, which is made by the photochemical isomerization of, of dehydrocholesterol. Uh, that's a very high value product but it's very niche. So you're talking about less than a, a, a ton per year. Um, but other than those kind of uh, compounds, there's really not a huge uh, application of, of photochemistry on a, on a large scale. So why won't we be interested in uh, looking at photochemistry and organic photochemistry in particular? Well, there's been 
quite a renaissance in, in organic photochemistry over the last few years. Um, there's a few drivers for that. So one is the, the fact that you can very quickly get to unusual molecular architectures, which can take you into uh, novel chemical space, uh, either for IP reasons or for uh, chemical property reasons. Uh, as an example from uh, last year, uh, here's a, a two-step, three-component synthesis from some very cheap starter materials, so ethyl pyruvate, allylamine, and acetyl chloride. And with this photochemical step, you generate these methano-bridged proline analogs, and you can readily imagine that those are uh, easily turned into uh, useful substructures for drug discovery. But if you want to do it on a reasonable scale, you're going to have to be able to scale the photochemistry. And of course, the, the real driver, for, or one of the real drivers for uh, this uh, needing to do photochemistry uh, more readily uh, is the advent of photoredox catalysis. Uh, so you can see this kind of, uh, this bar chart here of the number of publications on photoredox. So even in eight years, you can see the growth uh, in photoredox. I think if you'd gone into a lab, you know, 10 years ago, the chances of seeing uh, a photochemical lamp would have been pretty uh, few and far between. Uh, but if you go into a, a most discovery labs these days, you'd be hard pushed to find one that didn't have a, a lamp light to, uh, glowing away in the background there. Um, but as I'll show you uh, through our, our own studies, uh, scaling up photoredox chemistry can also be problematic. Oops. So, so why are photochemical reactions problematic? Well, amongst the, the reasons, um, of course, we have the, the well-known uh, issues with light penetration into batch reactors when you scale up um, because of the Beer-Lambert law, obviously, uh, as you scale out your batch reactor, uh, your surface area to volume ratio uh, is decreasing. And so uh, you have a problem that only the, the very uh, narrowest windows to, uh, at the front of the reactor are getting irradiated to a, any serious degree. That leads you to often, often have to extended reaction times as you scale up and they're so secondary photo reactions become a problem as do thermal reactions, which are uh, caused by uh, overheating from the lamp. And then you've got, of course, issues with variability in lamp performance with time, particularly with uh, incandescent sources uh, rather than LEDs, which have a, a much more kind of, uh, you know, binary type of performance or either on or off. Um, but the, the, the traditional candescent lamps, uh, you, you uh, have drop off with lamp performance with time. Uh, and you can particularly lose it at uh, specific wavelengths, which cause your reaction to stop working. And then there's lots of variability in terms of the experimental setup. And many of you that experienced that if you've tried photoredox chemistry, that uh, even something as trivial as fiddling around with the distance to the, the lamp source can make your reactions fairly irreproducible. And so potentially continuous processing could offer a solution to, to some or all of these problems. And certainly in terms of working a, a more consistent uh, experimental setup that would be facilitated by this. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples from our own chemistry where uh, we've hit issues with scale up uh, and flow chemistry. Um, so the first one is a reaction we disclosed uh, three years ago. Uh, it's a direct aromatic CH amination. So you take a, an N chloroamine uh, in an acidic solution and focalize it with UV light uh, using a, a medium pressure mercury lamp. And you get a very highly uh, selective uh, CH amination reaction. Uh, which works very nicely. Uh, the key to this chemistry is the uh, photolytic cleavage of this uh, N-chloro bond uh, to make this highly electrophilic aminium radical, which then uh, attacks the, the uh, ortho position and triggers the, the cyclization. And you can use this to make a variety of scaffolds. So many of them are kind of planar uh, heterocyclic structures. Uh, but you can also get uh, fused and bridged ring systems, and particularly these highly three-dimensional uh, structures uh, were attractive to uh, some industrial collaborators with, of ours, and they wanted to try and access larger quantities of material. So one of the issues with this chemistry, of course, is that n chloroamines are not commercial materials. You have to prepare them. So we developed a one-pot process where you can essentially form your n chloroamine in situ. So you take your free amine, you chlorinate it, then add acid and turn the lamp on. And again, you can get through to these materials direct from your amine precursor in reasonable yields. So that's a pretty efficient process. It's very easy to do. You don't have to isolate the N-chloroamines. However, it's still limited to about a couple of hundred milligrams per batch. 
over a few hour period. So in terms of high throughput of material, you're struggling really. So we thought about taking this to uh, a continuous process to see if we could improve the productivity. And we went to a tubular reactor. Now there are very many uh, tubular reactors commercially available and uh, you, uh, you could obviously buy one of those, but uh, being something of a cheapskate academic, uh, we stuck with the basic design, uh, which was introduced by Kevin Booker Milburn's group. It's just using UV permeable FEP tubing wrapped around your light source, which in this case is the medium pressure uh, mercury lamp. And then you can hook that up either to an HPLC pump uh, or a syringe pump. Uh, and that uh, that works very nicely. And uh, th this paper from Kevin's groups has attracted a large number of citations. It's a it's a very low tech solution, but essentially it's, it's no different to any of the commercial tubular reactors. Um, you, you've got a, a tube and a light source and a pump. Uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. So if you take a solution of your chloroamine and a solution of your acid, mix them via a T piece and pump them through this uh, tubular reactor, as uh, so a five milliliter reactor volume, uh, five minute residence time, you can see we can start to get gram per hour productivities here. Um, so that's not bad. It's a good deal more efficient uh, and higher throughput than the, uh, the batch reactions we've been doing. Um, but uh, that still requires us to start with the chloroamine. And here's where we kind of hit a, a snag. So ideally, we'd like to make the chloroamine in situ. And we should be able to do that by telescoping the continuous manufacture process so that we make the chloroamine in a tubular reactor uh, and then add the acid and pass it through the photochemical uh, reactor. And that works, but you'll notice that both the yield and the productivity have gone down considerably. And the reason for this is that the limiting factor is the solubility of the chlorinating reagent and chlorosuccinamide in the sol reaction solvent. Um, and so this set the solubility limit for our reactions uh, and basically that's a kind of two and a half fold dilution overall compared to the previous process. And that impacts not only the productivity, but actually also impacts the uh, efficiency of the photochemical step. So we get a lower yield coming out of that. So the productivity is down by a factor of about 75% because we need to have monophasic reaction mixture to, cope, to go through the tubular reactors. And that's going to always be an issue whenever you have a tubular uh, narrow tube reactor. So this highlights to us the need for a photocamp reactor, which is capable of dealing with multiphasic flow. And that's one of the, uh, one of the reasons why uh, we started thinking about modifying the free actors. So the second case study I'll uh, just go through um, before I hand over to Nick to explain about the free actors is uh, a paper we published last year. This is a photo redox mediated reaction. Uh, it's a powerful method to make uh, cyclic 1,2 uh, diamine derivatives. And the way that the reaction works is photocatalyzed. So you've got a photo excited iridium catalyst. It does an electron transfer uh, from this uh, in carbamate to make a radical cation, which is then trapped uh, by the amine species uh, to generate the product. And this works very nicely, but uh, as you can see, we're quite dilute. We're at long reaction times, and these are really not atypical of the kind of problems that you get, or the kind of reaction conditions rather, uh, for photo redox mediated transformations. And so, your uh, particularly the fact that it's a long it's a slow reaction. That means in a tubular reactor, you'd have a very very long uh, residence time. The reaction's really incredibly wide uh, scoping. So it works with uh, any aliphatic amines. Uh, it works with ammonia. This was the first example of a photocatalytic hydroamination with ammonia. It works with aromatic and heteroaromatic amines, and it works with azole heterocycles. And I'm sure that those of you who work in the, the pharmaceutical or agrochemical industry will recognize that some of these look like quite attractive little building blocks uh, to be able to use in uh, as either for uh, library decoration uh, or as scaffolds for library production. And again, some commercial partners wanted us to scale this chemistry, um, but the best we could do on uh, in batch scale was about 100 milligrams per batch. Uh, and so we had to scale this out. So basically running multiple batches with multiple lamps uh, to make gram quantities of material. And that's really not a satisfactory way to work. So 
particularly because this is a long, uh, slow uh, reaction, uh, small scale, and there's also issues with catalyst solubility, it's biphasic, uh, the catalyst is very poorly soluble and so ends up clogging uh, tubular reactors if you try to do that. This is again, not suitable uh, for your standard flow reactors. Okay, so hopefully those, those two examples will kind of convince you that we, we do need to consider for some applications, some alternative technologies. Uh, so I'll hand over now to Nick, who's gonna tell you about our uh, approach using the free actors. So if I stop sharing, Nick. Thanks, Steve. Can everyone see that? Yep, got some thumbs up. Fantastic. So I'm going to talk about the, uh, how we went from our CSTRs that we've been working with in Leeds, so um, our free actor system, and converted this into a photochemical platform as well by creating an add-on to it. Uh, I know some of you perhaps won't be familiar with, with the CSTR free actor system that we have, so I'll also give a very brief introduction to that. But before I do that, I want to just pick up on some of the controlling factors in photochemistry and talk about the differences between photochemistry within uh, pipe systems that Steve's already shown and some of the CSTR work that we've been doing. So um, I'm an engineer, I'm a fluid mechanicist, and uh, you know I know many of you out there will have a background in things like your Blonsky diagrams and things, but to my very simple mind, we start with a molecule in a ground state. We have to bring in some light at an appropriate wavelength to excite that molecule, and then it sits in this excited state. And it can sit there for quite a short time. So if it was uh, a photocatalyst molecule, it what might be one microsecond, but lots of other molecules are going to sit in that excited state for a much reduced time. And in that excited state, then it then has to meet either uh, another reactant and, and allow the reaction to proceed. So from a sort of physical perspective, really, we need photons to reach the correct molecules. So obviously light needs to enter a mixture and we need it to not be absorbed elsewhere. So that can either be the materials of construction of the reactor, or it can be the chemistry itself. So different molecules within the system are absorbing the, the uh, light at that wavelength, which prevents then those photons reaching where you want them to reach. So we've already talked about, or briefly said, the molecules need to absorb photons. So the wavelength of light's important. And the molecules then need to react, okay? So they need to meet the other appropriate molecules before this decay back to ground state happens. So we need to think about the concentration of molecules in the zone where the excitation is taking place. So we can then ask what can interact with the light and prevent the photons getting to the right place. So the first thing is, so here we have our light and we're going to assume that we've coupled this really well to our reactor. So we've wound our tubing or created our reactor in such a way that we're making efficient use of the light. We're not losing light outside of the reaction zone. And actually with tubular reactors, that can be a problem because the tubes have a thickness and you have to lay them together. So this is where people start to multi-wrap um, and, and play other little tricks with things. So there's the wall material and you know you can go to the literature and you can find transmission spectra such as this. So this, this is, I think, um, FEP, you can see down at the sort of 0 to 200, 250 uh, microns wavelength, we're losing um, transmission, it's absorbing the material, and then we get a sort of a linear rise and then good transmission through there. So that's the first thing we need to consider. And then the second thing that we need to consider is what's actually in the mixture itself. So here, um, if we're creating products and those products are strongly absorbing, that's going to prevent light getting to our reactants. If we've got a photocatalyst in our system, and Steve's going to talk about some of these different systems later on, um, we want our light to reach our photocatalyst. And there we have to make sure neither our product or our reactants are absorbing the light. And it's likely that if they do, um, so if our products are absorbing rather than our reactants, so we might then go and get side reactions taking place and we'll give an impurity to our mixture. And Steve's already mentioned this concept of a Beer-Lambert law. So it's the amount of absorbance of your light as your absorption coefficient times your path length times your concentration. And you can see in a real system that's changing, these aren't constant. So your absorption coefficient 
um, as you create reactants, for instance, in this example, that start, you know, that absorption coefficient is going to go up for those reactants. So your absorbance is also going to go up. As things um, react near the light, so I often term this the reaction zone near the top where there's loads of photons and lots of material, then the path length will start to increase because unless you're well mixed, it's meeting product first. And then your concentration as your reactants react also goes down as well. So this is, although we look at this equation, actually by thinking about how this links to the physics, we can get a really good understanding of our of what might be changing. So Steve already talked about the pipe flow example and pipes are, you know, have been applied widely and have found great application. Um, in a pipe though, it flows generally laminar and I'll, I'll put some figures up on the next slide. Here we have reactants and products. And in this example, and I, I use these examples almost as thought experiments, you can imagine the products strongly absorbing and you can start to say, well, what does that mean? for photochemistry within a tubular reactor system. So with a flow system now, um, our position within the pipe dictates how long the reaction's been proceeding. So near the start of the pipe, the reaction's not been proceeding very long. That's like early on in your batch system. Later on, um, you've had, a, you know, your flow's going from left to right. Later on, um, we've had a longer time within that pipe system. So early reactions, late reactions. So here, in this example, we'd, we could potentially have a high reaction rate because we have a lot of product concentration, sorry, a lot of reactant concentration near the tube wall where the light's entering. So we have a fast reaction rate. Later on down the tube though, that reaction rate could well go down because now we have a strongly absorbing product. And that means that our reduced, we have a reduced photon count to our reactants because the reaction layer is near the wall and as the light comes through, it's absorbed by the product. Okay, so that can lead to side products. So the transport of material in and out of this reaction zone can be really important. Now, this was just one example with reactants and products. Sometimes you can have photocatalysts in there. There are many different combinations, but I'm just using this to try and pro promote, if you like, or provoke a bit of thought. So the other thing that we can do is we can start to put some time scales on these things. So we're quite interested, for instance, in a pipe system, how long does it take to flow material through the pipe and how long does it take time, uh, time to diffuse across the pipe? So we, we have this non-dimensional number for those of you that love those out there, something called a Peclet number. And it's really the ratio of two time scales. So we can just postulate a typical setup now. So one millimeter, one milliliter per minute flow, five meters length of PFA tubing, some typical dimensions there gives about a 10 minute resident time. So flow that goes in on the left-hand side takes on average 10 minutes to come out on the right-hand side. So the first thing we do as a fluid mechanicist is work out the Reynolds number. And this tells us whether we're in this laminar region where flows um, almost layer by layer, or if we're in a turbulent region where mixing is really um, intense within the tube because of the turbulent nature of the flow. And typically a Reynolds number will come out for about 13 or 20, something like that for a flow like this. So that's, that's way below the transition from laminar to turbulent. So we're in a laminar regime. So, and our time to flow through this reactor is 10 minutes. We can then go away and make some estimates of how long things take to diffuse across the width of the pipe. Okay, so we can write down this equation. Typical time scale for diffusion is x squared, so that's some length, square, length scale squared, so I can take my diameter of my tube divided by my diffusion coefficient. And just for the sake of it, I've just taken as a typical diffusion coefficient as 5 times 10 to the minus 9 meters per square. So it takes, on average, 40 minutes for a molecule to diffuse from the bottom surface of the wall to the top surface of the wall. So you can see that if your reaction is taking place and you're creating product, that's strongly absorbing, you actually need your product to diffuse out of this region and your reactants to diffuse into this region. But this diffusion time scale is a lot longer actually than your flow time scale. So it could be in this reactor that material's flowing through from the left to the right and it's never seeing photons of light, okay? 
And it also means a product, not reactants, are in your reaction zone. And then you have a risk of byproduct formation. So there's a real need for enhanced mixing within these systems, even in a single phase flow system. So some of the tricks people play when they're thinking about these types of systems is they coil their tubes. And the thought behind that is you can, if you take a cross section in the tube, you can get these recirculations within the tube called Dean flows. So just as turbulence creates a lot of mixing compared to a laminar flow, uh, Dean's flow, these secondary vortex flows can also give you enhanced mixing. And typically we need a Dean's number of about 70 to set up these flows. And when you work these numbers through on a typical, say, 50 millimeter diameter pipe wrap, your D number is only two. So we're not getting these secondary flows. So the other way that we can do things, though, is we can move to continuous stirred tank reactor systems. And that's what I'm going to be predominantly talking about from now on. Now, the stirred tank reactor system that we're going to be talking about is uh, the mini free or the free actor systems, and I'll show you these in a moment. Um, we've talked about single phase flow, but as Steve's already said, actually multiphasic flow could be really important for us because it means we could use liquid liquid systems, we could use gas liquid systems, or we could use solid liquid systems. And these traditionally aren't well behaved within pipe systems. You can do multiphasic systems, but if you have solids in there, there's a risk that solids settle to the bottom of the pipe. And the phase transport between your two immiscible phases, whether it's liquid liquid or gas liquid, can be very low with these multiphasic systems within a pipe. So traditionally in a lab, this is where batch reactors come in because you can use active mixing and tubular reactors don't perform as well with these mixed uh, fluid phase systems. We always make an argument really that we should be using lab tools that have characteristics of what we would do in practice. And actually when you look in practice, most production processes do involve multiphasic systems because you can exceed, um, because your material solubilities can be exceeded. So your productivity goes up. Products, or oh, sorry, processes can require or evolve gases. Um, we can keep solid catalysts suspended and we can also do things like crystallization. So there's a real advantage to be able to doing these things in the laboratory rather than, you know, maybe solubilizing all of your material, which in a way changes the reaction conditions and the reaction um, operability that you can reach within the laboratory. So uh, I'm just going to my laser pointer I'm just going to play this quick video this this shows you very clearly the difference between multiphasic flow in tube so here with a syringe pump pushing um, a green aqueous system and a clear oil system and you can see in a typical TP it's running at two mils per minute you end up with these discrete droplets now there will be some phase transport between them but by carbon paris and the free actor system so this is a typical free actor system. These are five mini C five CSDRs that sit on a single hot plate. Um, and again, we've got our two feeds going into the system. If I run this at the moment, you'll see the stirrers are, are mixing in each of the reaction zones. And you get really good mixing in this system. Uh, in a second, you'll see the outlet pipe. I'll just pause that there. It's very difficult to see, but you've got um, an oil in water, I think, emulsion within that system. It's a very fine mixture of things. So really good, really high surface areas between your two phases. And we've shown that these systems are quite good at dealing with solids. You can crystallize in them. There's a whole range of things. And I'm sure Martin will post links afterwards if you want more information about those types of systems. So we had a platform that we'd been developing with Asynth. Um, that was very capable of dealing with multiphasic systems and we were interested in bringing photochemistry to that. So there were three papers in 2019, in fact probably more actually on photochemistry but I've picked out three, so clearly a vintage year for photochemical reactions within CSDRs. So the first that came out with it was this paper by Wittenberger's group where they actually took a fiber optic laser, um, you can buy these things on eBay. They're rather scary, 25 watts of collimated power, 450 nanometers, so that's a blue laser. They used a beam expander and they simply shone this at the top of a, a stirred tank 
sorry, um, an open beaker and they pumped in and pumped out and got some really great performances for the chemistry as they were doing. So a nice idea, but particularly not difficult to deal or not easy to deal with in a lab. This is classed as a laser system. We developed our Freactor system, so our mini CSDR that sit on the single hot plate. And by chance, I'd been developing some um, high powered uh, UV photochemistry modules actually for some colleagues in biology where we were interested in freezing reactions. So we were using these to, uh, to capture the movement of a protein within um, a system. So I'd been developing these and what we were able to do is bring these two together. And that's what I'm going to show you in a moment. And then there was also a paper that came out after these two uh, by Klaus Jensen's group. Um, and he did a really nice piece of work looking at CSDRs are similar to these systems for handling solid containing photochemical reactions. Uh, this is the free actor system. So these are the individual modules. There's a safety shield on there. Um, and it was a case of really taking those and converting those to a photochemistry system. So this was sort of a historic, if you like, um, kind of development of product device. Uh, development cycle. So these were what we started with in the lab. We showed some really interesting performance with these. Um, this was our first prototype. Uh, this was clearly designed by me, had none of the nice thrills of the beautiful system that we ended up with. And then this is a system now that um, Asynth have now commercialized. And I'll, I'll show you how easy it is to use this system in a moment. So it takes exactly the same free actors that we have. Um, you replace the front finger nut with this uh, pin. So this is a safety pin and it switches the lamp on and off. And then you simply place the module on the top. And that's what it looks like with them all together. So the operating characteristics of the free actors, um, they're very easy to use. You just simply finger tightening fittings, uh, very low barrier of entry. And there's another video on that, so I'm not going to go into this. Um, the nice thing about the photo flow modules then is they're LED based. So 365 nanometers upwards. Um, in a variety of wavelengths and actually really good power at these. So typically at 365 uh, nanometers, we're getting about five watts of radiant flux per LED, a single LED in each one. Um, and it goes up slightly as we move up the wavelengths. There's a long lifetime and no degradation in performance. And they're very easy to use. They fit directly on the free actors. You lift them off to switch them off and you can use between one and five modules per free actor platform. So there's a great de deal of flexibility with these systems. I'm very briefly going to talk about two of the things that we did in that original paper, and Steve's going to fill you in on some more of the chemistry. But we did some work um, looking at uh, flow actinometry. So we were interested in uh, converting um, uh, nitrobenzaldehyde to nitrobenzoic acid. Um, because we know the quantum yield at 365 nanometers. So we're able to work out from that how good they, these reactors were using the light. And we found that we were getting typically 10 times greater than in previously reported batch systems. So the very nature of the mixing um, in this system, we could see immediate benefits. And then we got a bit carried away. Um, we probably should have done some simpler reactions, but we decided to do a really complicated one. And we started to look at tetralin to tetralone. And from a flow perspective, this is really challenging because we're using gases and liquids within our systems. Um, so mixing becomes very important. And we actually ran this in an automated sense. So we were able to analyze product online and then change conditions. But I'm not gonna talk about that today. Uh, the mixing um, we found um, mixed really well within our systems and we got uh, material mixed into and out of what I would term our reaction zone and can also minimize secondary reactions with that. And just by comparison then with this system we were seeing a residence time of about 18 minutes. This is optimum conditions. We were using air and benzophenone as a, a photo initiator within the system or a, sorry photocatalyst within the system. So that's very cheap material. Um, the original paper that we'd compared this to was a, a really nice piece of work again by uh, Professor Noel, Noel's group. Um, they, they were using oxygen in a, a tubular system, uh, so residence time of about 45 minutes, pure oxygen TBA DT, which was the catalyst they were using. Um, so they were using this in 
a lot lower quantities, but the benzophenone is is far, far cheaper. So I think we're on about four pence a gram, whereas this is 300 pounds per gram. So in a way, it's a more accessible and atom economic photosensitizer within the system. So that's my part finished. Um, I'm just going to very quickly, Aaron, I think you've um, spotlighted me, just show you how we use these systems. So that's the single CSTR. Um, these are the thumb screws that we normally have on them. So they're very easy for people to use, take the lids off, clean all of the rest of them. Um, and we replace that thumb screw by uh, this pin. Okay, just spin that onto there. So there's a family joke that I've got hands like spanners, so I'm not going to use a spanner. So our pin sits just on the top of there and that's our safety pin. This is the module. So it's really, you know, probably what, about 50 millimeters, 60 millimeters high. Um, and you can see that's just going to drop onto the reactor like that. Obviously you need to plug it in. So standard power supply um, goes in the top, nothing shining there, like some sort of bad magic trick, this isn't it? And I drop that onto there and you can just see the light coming out of these reactors, out of these ports. So normally there would be pipes coming out of these. So really, really straightforward to use. That's all you need to do. So with that, Steve, I'm going to hand back to you and you're going to talk about a few chemistries that we've run with this system. Okay, so hopefully that slide back on. Yep. Great. Okay, so I'm going to take you through two quick case studies. Um, the first is the scale up of this photo redox hydroamination chemistry. So just to remind you, it's used a long reaction time, a partially insoluble catalyst, which drops out in the tubular reactors, as Nick has said, and we're dealing with a maximum throughput of about 100 mg per batch per day uh, under the old uh, system. Uh, just to flag, actually, one of the things we, we found is that actually we can use the individual free actor elements as a very convenient photochemical batch reactor, um, uh, particularly nice because of the, the lack of light spillage from it, so you don't have to worry about shielding and so forth. Um, but we obviously wanted to put this into flow. So to start with, so we're just using, uh, we're pumping our solution of reactants through, and we're using two of the modules in series, 50 microliters per minute flow rate, so it's a residence under about one and a half mils uh, units. So you've got a residence time of about half an hour here. And we're getting uh, a, a modest conversion. Uh, so 37% yield, 42% conversion. Uh, one of the issues is that the photocatalyst actually decomposes. So we're better actually stopping the reaction at lower conversions. It's more economical in terms of the catalyst. Uh, but even this simple system, we're already now at grams per day. So it's a 15 fold improvement in productivity just in that first kind of pass experiment. Now there are five different stations on the, uh, or five stations on the free actor. Uh, so if you put them all in series, obviously then at, uh, you're increasing the, the reaction, reactor volume so you can whack up the, the flow rate. Um, and so if you put the five reactors in series, increase the flow rate, um, the, the yield and conversions are pretty similar, uh, but your productivity is again going up. So it's a factor of two and a half. So now we're at multigrams per day very easily uh, using this, this simple platform. And these examples here, these productivities are all for the two reactor configuration. So you can multiply by two and a half to get the throughput from a five reactor configuration. Uh, but you can see for a range of different products, uh, we're able to get in most cases uh, multi-gram per day uh, productivities. And so, yeah, if you multiply them by the two and a half, you can get up to sort of five grams-ish uh, of product a day out of these compounds. Now, that might not seem a lot, but it's probably enough to feed um, a, a small arm of a discovery project. And as I say, compared to the productivities that we're seeing in batch, we're now at about a 40-fold increase in productivity. So these kind of very slow uh, photoredox catalyzed reactions, I think, are really at the kind of uh, the, the harder edge of what it is to, to do uh, in terms of photochemistry because they're, they're so sluggish. So to do be able to do these in a CSTR uh, has enabled us to make multigrams of material where we, we previously wouldn't have had a, uh, a hope in hell of doing that. So that's a slow reaction. Let's move to a reaction that's at the other end of the scale and see how the, the, the uh, photo free reactor behaves. So let's think about a faster reaction. So a photo promoted Bromination. So Volziegler benzylic and allylic bromination. 
uh, has been studied in flow before. Uh, you can do foles ziegler chemistry either thermally or photochemically initiated. The photochemical reactions are much preferable, particularly on scale, uh, because they give fewer secondary byproducts. Um, and here's an example from the literature from uh, Oliver Kappa's group from 2000, uh, 2014. Um, so they'd used a Booker Milburn type tubular reactor wrapped around a, a household uh, lamp there, um, visible light irradiation, uh, to promote this Volziegler bromination. And they were able to get productivity up to about uh, 30 millimoles per hour. So it's about nine grams of material per hour going through. So we wanted to see how the, the free actor uh, behaved versus this. So this is our first pass experiment. Again, two reactors in series here, one and a half mils per minute flow rate. Uh, and we're getting uh, productivities which are of the productivities which are of the order of that which Kappa. So Kappa was getting nine grams per hour in his optimized system. This first pass, we're getting nearly as good as that. Um, so this is actually one of the more challenging substrates. In electron-rich uh, toluenes are actually known to react faster because the, uh, the CH bond cleavage, which is rate limiting, is, is faster when you have an electron donating group. Uh, so actually for anisole and for moderately electron-rich systems like alcohol uh, substituted toluenes, uh, you can actually ramp the flow rate up um, and you can see that the productivity again at these um, two reactor setups, you can now get up to kind of uh, towards 20 grams per hour of product out of those, those two reactors. Um, so that's great. Can you push it further? Uh, well, obviously, if you put more reactors in series, again, you can ramp the flow rate up to, to maintain a constant residence time. Uh, this is real data. I didn't believe it when, when Dan actually showed the, the postdoc actually showed me this. Uh, I, I, was, I was convinced that he just, uh, he just um, drawn this for me, but uh, I've never seen an R squared like it, but it does behave scale linearly. So at five reactors, you can get about 20 grams per hour of material uh, coming through, even in this more challenging uh, substrate. OK, so that would be uh, nice enough on its own, um, but we wanted to push it a little bit further. And, and Nick uh, has already pointed to the, the fact that you can do multiphasic reactions uh, in the free actors. So he's discussed the, uh, the gas liquid reaction in terms of the oxygen mediated uh, benzylic oxidation uh, of tetralin to tetralone. What about solid liquid uh, reactions? So it turns out the limit of throughput of reactivity in the Kappa system is the solubility limit of the embromosuccinamides. This is effectively the same problem that we saw in our N-chloroamine chemistries, that the, the halogenating agent is the limiting reagent in terms of solubility. But the free actors can handle slurries. It's already been shown in the previous work that Nick uh, has done that the free actors are perfectly happy handling slurries. So there's no need for us to have a homogeneous reaction system. So what would happen if we pump a suspension uh, of the uh, embromosic cinemide? So formerly at two molar, um, that's a fourfold increase in the concentration of the reaction. So just going through two reactors here, um, you can see that the, the conversions and selectivities hold up. And we're now just in the two reactor convert uh, systems up at um, you know, north of 30 grams per hour for some of these substrates. And obviously, if you scale that out uh, to uh, the five reactors, uh, you could multiply that productivity by uh, a factor of two and a half. Um, so you're getting up not quite to, but towards 100 grams per hour just from something that sits on top of your uh, stir or hot plate. So these are really, really uh, very efficient systems. But as I say again, the, the ability to handle this multiphasic system uh, is really what's key here. So I'm just going to finish with a, uh, an example uh, where we're making a, a perhaps slightly more uh, interesting molecule. So this is Valzartan, typical of the, uh, the Zartan class of antihypertensives, and it contains this uh, benzylic amine substituent uh, on this tetrazolyl biphenyl which is made from this bromide that's a common building block for all of the Zartans and those are often made uh, by a benzylic uh, bromination process so uh, this is again the two two reactors in series here uh, with our, uh, our substituted toluene and our bromide so this is the homogeneous conditions half molar and acetonitrile very good selectivities pretty good conversions and we can get almost 10 grams per hour of product, so you're nearly a quarter of a kilo 
of material per day. Uh, but if again, you switch to the slurry uh, system, uh, this time at one and a half molar, uh, you can get a threefold increase in productivity. So you can get up towards uh, 17 grams per hour. And this is heading, heading towards half a kilo of material per day again, just on something that sits on top of your uh, stirrer hot plate. Okay, so I hope those two case studies have given you a bit, just a bit of an introduction to what the, the free actor can do. Um, so we think they're really useful because we've got this uh, ability to, to get high photon flux levels at variable wavelengths. They integrate really nicely already with the free, uh, free actor flow platform, and you can think about daisy chaining into other processes like secondary reactions after your photochemical process or crystallizations, as Nick has said. Uh, we can use homogeneous systems, including liquid, solid, and gas liquid, and we've actually had a little bit of luck with some gas liquid solid triphasic systems as well. And they're pretty good for handling different reaction regimes, so short to long residence times on a single platform rather than having to switch platforms when your reaction kinetics are changing. Uh, so we really think this is a potentially useful new tool uh, in flow chemistry that uh, you might find interesting to explore. So I'm going to finish there. I won't thank everybody uh, in, uh, who's on, named on this slide in detail, but uh, our collaborator, Professor John Black, who many of you may know uh, from the Institute of Process Research and Development, was also integral to the development of this module. Um, particularly like to thank the Flow Club project who did the, uh, the uh, case study work and the final development. And of course, a big thanks to all of the team at ASIN, particularly Fionn, Kerry and Martin for uh, supporting us through this process. Uh, so Nick and I would both be very happy to take any questions that people have got uh, after this presentation. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, that's all really, really fascinating. Actually, it's the first time that um, I've seen uh, some of Nick's slides. And actually, it's uh, been really quite an eye opener, um, being that we've been involved in flow chemistry, especially Kerry and I for many years now for our sister company, Nixus. So it's interesting. Um, just before we go to questions, uh, Mike's going to lead that. Um, I've got a setup here with a free actor with five modules on. Um, basically, very simple. You can have one power supply input and using uh, various um, types of splitter cables, we can run between one and five at the same time. So it's this type of thing. So when you order, you can order these as individual units of choice, and you can then uh, order accessories like one one power supply um, and a splitter cable if you just want two two units, for instance. That's straightforward. Um, just talk to the team here at the Synth to find out more. Currently, um, so one of the questions was asking what's available now. At the moment, in stock and available, we have three six five and 450 nanometer units. Um, others will be available on request. Um, basically, we just put in a different uh, photo uh, LED, um, so, but they will be sort of uh, on request and we'll see how uh, popularity for other frequencies goes, but they are available um, as uh, was listed in the presentations. So I'll pass over now, Mike, to Mike for uh, questions. Um, sure thing. Thank you. So I'll just run through what we've got in the chat. And if anyone has any any questions, if they just add them to the chat, and I'll make sure we go through them. But the, the first one I've got from Paul is uh, with the with regards to the N-chloroamine chemistry uh, regarding the cases with moderate yields, is elimination to imines also a reason, even though conditions are acidic? Um. Thanks, Paul. That's a really good question. Um, so the answer is no, actually, in most cases, that is not a problem. The, the, um, most of the um, mass balance is actually reduced chloroamine, so it reduces back to the primary amine, presumably by hydrogen abstraction from the solvent. In very specific number of cases, particularly if you have an aromatic next door to the amine uh, or a carboxylic ester next door to the amine, you do see a little bit of the elimination. Uh, but for the most part, it's just... Uh, reductive uh, cleavage of the chloroamine back to the back to the secondary amine so you effectively isolate it as your as your starting material perfect and uh next question we have from virage three um 
so Martin's answered about the different wavelengths, but we have a question about exotherm control in the photoreactor. So how, you know, how does the, how does the, the exotherm of the actual power of the LEDs kind of play yeah, out? I'll, I'll perhaps answer that. So at the moment we don't have any um, cooling on there. Um, I know myself and Martin have been talking about a cooling base for the free actor. So rather than just sitting on a um, aluminium hot plate, we could potentially put a cooling uh, coil in there. So that's, it's on the wish list. So I guess if people need that sort of technology, then yeah, talk to the team at ASYNTH about that. We, um, yeah. That would be a way of controlling that. Go on, Martin. We have completed a design uh, for a cooling base. Um, so something just to remove exotherms is very, very simple. That design is finished. Um, it's not designed, uh, not finished for very low temperature chemistry, so subambient, but for cooling an exothermic reaction, that design is available. Um, we just need to make some and they will work because we're, we're very experienced in the cooling bases, etc., with the dry sink. Um, can I just pick up, there was a question about um, LEDs uh, with a lower wavelength than 300 nanometers. And I know Martin sort of indicated 365 and upwards. So the reason for that is because the LED technology is at lower than 365, sort of UV, um, C and UVB actually aren't really there. Uh, so you don't get the power output that you need from those sorts of LEDs. So for the moment, you're probably stuck with using um, you know, high pressure mercury tubes or whatever tubes you're using uh, for those lower wavelengths. So that's just a limitation really of LED technology at the moment. You can get the LEDs are very expensive, but very then milliwatts of outputs compared to watts of output when you get to 365 nanometers and upwards. Perfect, thanks Nick. Um, we've just got one in from Ian. Um, how can the, how well does the reactor handle solid liquids um, heterogeneous reactions, would the solid phase lag from the liquid phase? And can the system handle oxygen and water sensitive reactions? Yeah, so certainly with heterogeneous reactions, we've run a variety of kind of catalyst systems through these reactions, both photochemistry and non-photochemistry. And I, we can make sure some of the papers come to you afterwards. Um, the mixing in each module is really good, actually. So the suspension of the uh, of the solid in there is really good, and we don't notice any particular lag. Um, it flows fairly evenly as a well suspended solid. Sometimes we have played tricks like uh, you can buy um, these, these fixtures. You can buy them with fritz in the bottom, so we can load up a reactor with an, an amount of solid in there and keep that solid in there, so it's stirred and actively mixed. Um, so if there's something that has the capability of a lot of turnovers, that can be quite neat because you, you just leave um, solid in each reaction. Um, can it handle oxygen and water sensitive reactions? Yeah, absolutely. So we've done um, probably actually more in the polymer world of where we've done some reactions that are very sensitive to water, where if there's any kind of water around it, it terminates the polymer growth and, um, you know, just by careful handling of the reactors, making sure they're dry, you know, perhaps paying a little bit more attention to making sure there's no leaks in there. And yeah, we've not really had any challenges with those. I guess if it was very sensitive, you know, such that the transmission of oxygen through the pipes, for instance, becomes an issue, then, you know, that might be more challenging but in general. Sorry, Nick, I think someone's muted okay. there. Uh, so I've, I think that, that covers that, that question anyway. Yep. Um, so we've got one from Maria uh, just regarding the, the geometries of the uh, magnetic stirrer fleas. So you've got the cross-shaped ones, uh, a standard, uh, do you offer different magnetic stirring geometries for different applications or do you find that's not? We, we've tended to use a cross throughout and actually when you look at the motion of them, because they're off center on a stirrer hot plate, they actually bounce around fairly vigorously within the reactors themselves, and that gives good mixing. And we've measured various mass transport rates and they're very high. So we haven't done any particular work. We did a little bit of work on suspending some stirrer bars, but this was research rather than 
practical application um, just to prevent crystal um, um, breakage, um, but nothing commercial. Um, so yeah, that probably answers that question. Fantastic. And I think the last one we've got is from Paul, uh, just regarding what's the, the, the future plans regarding um, kind of manufacturing scales, uh, you know, for things like pharmaceutical companies yeah. and taking it to the next. So that's a really good question. And it's something that, you know, I think as a technology, this is, it, it is scalable. Um, in the, as we go up in our reactor size, we obviously need more LEDs. And actually, rather than having individual reactors, I do have a design that's probably three quarters of the way complete for a sort of a plate based system. Um, again, I think it's, it's sometimes the motivation of that. So uh, probably where we are in Leeds for our kind of grammage and multi grammage quantities per day, um, probably feel quite comfortable. But I think, again, if people want to talk to me about that, I'm you know happy to do that. Um, IPRD is all about linking uh, process and you know chemistry together so that's something that you know we think about quite a lot so yeah fantastic and we do have the the free actor maxi available as well which yeah is, absolutely is a little bit larger yeah it's larger in volume and, and these units actually fit on the free actor maxi um so you can kind of you know look at different residence times and things and different flow rates the light flux into those though from a single unit would would be about the same so Maybe from photochemistry perspective, you're not gaining quite as much, but um, scaling out this type of technology, I think is fairly doable and probably more economic than going to the kind of glass reactors where people have glass reactor, big bank of lights, glass reactor, probably easier to use and safer as well, would be my guess. It's the light's very contained in these types of systems. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much. I don't think there's any more questions in the chat, but if I've missed any um, or people have questions after, I'm sure that they can let us know and we can get those answered uh, at a later stage. Um, I guess I can pass back over maybe to, to Martin or to, to Aaron to wrap things up. Um, well, just to say thank you very much to, uh, to everybody for attending today really appreciate uh, we have a, a lot of people so glad there's a lot of interest in photochemistry and you know really fascinating for me as well to listen to uh, uh, Steve and Nick's presentations today um, we um, the products now available and uh, so if we're shipping the first today to the first customer first customer order so it's good timing this webinar. So let the guys know if you want to find out any more info, we're going to post uh, various links online and um, we shall certainly uh, be able to answer all your questions. If, as Nick said, if you want to collaborate with the University of Leeds, especially about larger scale, get in contact uh, with Nick directly. And I'm sure they'll be very happy to talk further. But, um, just thanks everyone for coming. That's great. Thank you very much. And thanks. thanks for your attention, everybody. Many thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.